Almost three years ago, Canada was late to the vaccine hunt. We discovered we didn't make them here and relied on getting vaccines from foreign suppliers. Why weren't we making them here? Good question. Canadians have long been proud of the discovery of insulin 100 years ago, just as we were proud of BlackBerry and other tech leaders that made big breakthroughs. Are we just dining out on our past glories these days? Can we do better? Let's find out with, in the nation's capital, Sarah Laframboise, a PhD student in biochemistry at the University of Ottawa. She's also co-organizer of the advocacy group and science movement, Support Our Science. In Kingston, Ontario, Dr. Stephen Archer, head of the Department of Medicine at Queen's University and a clinician scientist who directs a Canadian Institutes of Health Research lab. And here in our studio, Ivan Semenuk, science journalist at the Globe and Mail. Ivan, it's good to see you back in that chair again. It's been a long time. And to uh, Sarah and Stephen and Points Beyond, thank you for joining us tonight as well. We're going to set this discussion up just by sharing some stats, which will lay out the issue that we're about to talk about. So, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring these up and discover why the funding pinch many graduate students are feeling is a real thing. 86% of grad students are currently experiencing stress and anxiety related to their finances. 40% of grad students struggle to pay the rent and grocery bills. A third have considered leaving academia solely because of financial concerns. 38% of PhD students leave Canada to continue their careers abroad. That's quite the brain drain. Here are some more stats about our country's scientists and researchers. If you're a master's student, $19,000, that's what you get, minus $8,000 for tuition to the university, that leaves them with a net salary of $11,000. $23,000 is the average salary for a PhD student, minus $8,000 tuition, leaving the average PhD student with a net salary of $15,000 a year. A postdoctoral fellow, an academic with a PhD, likely to be probably 30 years old or in their early 30s, Average pay, $45,000, minus nearly $7,000 in taxes, leaves them with a net salary south of $40,000. Now, Sarah, you helped compile that data, so let me go to you first. What's your big takeaway from all those numbers? Yeah, and thank you for sharing that today. I think the, the story that it's showing is that we're really not creating an ecosystem in Canada that is conducive for students to continue on in Canada. Um, we're seeing students leave to other countries after their uh, PhD to do a postdoc in other countries that will pay upwards of $60,000 a year. Um, that's an American or US dollars. So um, we're just not creating a system that is conducive to creating research and innovation in Canada right now. And I think those stats really illustrate um, exactly why that's happening. Um, and as you mentioned, the age of these students, um, these are, are much older than undergrad students. Um, they're mid 30s, often a postdoc, um, a PhD students mid to late 20s. Um, these are young adults who care about things like other young adults, so they're often behind many of their peers. Stephen Archer, what's your takeaway from those numbers? Yeah, the, there is definitely a problem with the payment of graduate students, and we have a vibrant uh, program here called Translational Medicine, and the graduate students there get about $23,000 a year, which is not competitive. I, I think also the graduate students are paid really ultimately by their principal investigators, and when the time is right in this interview, I'm happy to share the CIHR funding rates because the money coming into our lab translates into what we can pay scientists, including graduate students, and there's just not enough of that money coming in. Ivan, why do you think that is? Well, Canada historically has uh, underperformed as uh, in, in the total amount that it allocates to science. So just to kind of put it in a global perspective, you know, if we look across OECD countries, there's a metric called research intensity. It's how much of your GDP is put towards research and development. The average for developed countries is about 2.6% of GB GDP, maybe 2.7. Canada is consistently under 2%, about 1.8 or so. Now, now, 20 years ago, it was a lot closer. Uh, we've sort of flatlined all through that time where globally the investment in research has increased. So, you know, it just, we are falling behind in that way. Well, play that out. What are the mm -hmm. consequences of continuing to fall behind in your view? I think the consequence, some of them are that uh, we don't have a place uh, for, for our own scientists that we train. They have to go abroad. I think it's deeper, though. It means that there are fewer people, people working on scientific issues that might be especially relevant to Canada. Uh, and, uh, you know, perhaps uh, uh, not contributing to um, uh, an environment or a community where we have a lot more 
uh, highly qualified people in the country. You know, they have to, to go abroad to, to see those, uh, to find those jobs. And I think there's a deeper issue too, which is what is Canada's role in the world? You know, science is a kind of combination of uh, a collective work, like everyone's working together to find the answers, vaccines, cures, discoveries, but it's also competitive, you know, from an economic basis, even individual basis. That's how humans operate, right? <clears throat> Groups of people cooperate and, and compete. Uh, so what is Canada's contribution to this if we're kind of not really uh, putting in our two cents enough, and instead we're putting in our 1.8 cents, <laughs> and, uh, and it, it kind of raises a question about our role in the world. Stephen, let me tap into a bit of your background here, because I think, if memory serves, you, you, you did some of your research in Chicago once upon a time? Yes, yeah, I've been on both sides of the border, what happened in Canada and happened in the United States. I mean, I think what's important to recognize, getting to Ivan's comments, is that our, most of the money for research in Canada comes from CIHR. And it used to be that CIHR funded 31 or so percent of all the grants that were submitted to it. These are the project grants that actually pay for the scientists and the graduate students and the materials to do research. Now it funds 18 to 20 percent. So there's been a marked fall off in the success rate and most labs like mine require about three grants to run. So we're continuously writing grants to try to get this money. So to keep me my half a million dollar payroll, I have to have three grants at any one time. The success of any grant, even at my stage in career, let alone a junior investigator, is only 18 percent. So for example, my last successful grant I submitted three times before it was funded, and yet I'm an acknowledged leader in that field in the world. Uh, and when the money comes in, the problems don't stop. And again, I'm not criticizing CHR, and I think many people are afraid to speak out for being perceived as being disloyal, but I think the truth needs to out. And the reality is once you get your grant after your second or third try, the budget is cut 23.5% automatically across the top. So you don't actually have enough money to do what you propose to do in the grant. And then the other place that we go, and I'll stop with this, uh, is, the, is CFI, which is a wonderful organization that the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, and they give us money for large infrastructure, but what they don't fund are the scientists to run that infrastructure. So I have several proposals that I'm happy to speak about, if you wish, for how we could change CIHR funding and how we could change CFI funding to stabilize things. And spoiler alert, the Naylor report that came out in 2017 spelled it out, and part of the problem is $1.4 billion more in spending on Canadians. Well, just before we go, okay, before we go there to your ideas, I, I want to draw on the Chicago experience. What was it like when you were in Chicago? So I'm in Canada. I'm Canadian. I love Canada. So my, my responses are not a criticism of Canada. But for example, when I was recruited to be chief of cardiology at University of Chicago, I was offered $15 million as a startup package to recruit scientists and fund my own lab. Uh, I was offered $1 million at Queen's University to start my own lab, and half of that was spent renovating my lab. I chose to come here because my values as a cardiologist and head of medicine are more aligned to the Canadian values of universal access to health care. Uh, but definitely, Dr. Richard Resnick, who recruited me, offered me the chance to apply for a Canada Research Chair, and I knew I could apply for CIHR funding. So those were two big inducements to come back to a more humane healthcare system. Gotcha. But that's been eroded. Hmm. All right, Sarah, um, normally we don't ask people a lot of personal financial questions on this program, but <laughs> you are here, and this is the story. So if you don't mind, uh, let's just sort of... Um, pull the curtain back a bit and find out about your uh, educational financial journey. Um, I'm guessing you did, Absolutely. where'd you do your undergrad? I went to York University. So I did an undergraduate in biology and then moved to the University of Ottawa to start my master's uh, in 2018 and then transferred to my PhD in 2020. Um, so yeah, I've been, this is now my 11th year of <laughs> post-secondary education, which seems a little crazy, but um, along that time, I have self-funded most of my education. Um, that means taking out grants like OSAP. Um, at the moment, I'm sitting at over $100,000 in student debt, um, and that's 11 years of paying tuition. Um, when I started my master's degree, I was making about $19,000 a year. Um, and then moving on to my PhD, um, I about two years ago got an NSERC uh, CGS award, which now is about $35,000. So, um, I'm now in a better financial situation than I was, but I mean, 35000 still is barely enough to cover most of my monthly expenses. You know, 35000 is, uh, to be sure, and, and the kind of situation you find yourself in, I gather you can't really be moonlighting at a bodega or something like that to try to get a little <laughs> extra money on the side. Do I have that right? 
No, yeah, and actually there's a lot of restrictions in place that don't allow students to work outside of their studies. So if you do get one of these Tri-Council scholarships or a lot of universities will regulate this 10 hour rule, which stops students from working more than 10 hours outside of their studies. Um, so, I mean, I've pushed the limits of that probably throughout my degree, mostly out of necessity. Um, in the last 11 years, I've worked probably upwards of 15 jobs uh, just to make ends meet. I've always been kind of a self-starter that way. So you, you're, you're clearly um, ambitious enough to want to get this done. I don't have to tell you what the stats are on PhD students eventually being able to get the jobs that they want to get at the end of the day. You think you're going to make it? <laughs> I hope so. Um, I think that's probably the most daunting kind of aspect of all of this is being so close and seeing all of these stats. Um, it is definitely discouraging. Um, in my mind, it, it's mostly troublesome when I think about future students coming up through the system will have it worse off than me if things don't change with inflation increasing at the rate that it is. It's only going to get worse. So um, I often worry about what the system is kind of making this certain type of person that is able to pursue this type of education and financially can take on all of these types of burdens. Understood. Well, it's not like we don't have a history of science excellence in this country. I mean, we mentioned a few of them off the top. The discovery of insulin 100 years ago, the Canadarm, which uh, people of a certain age will remember, Northern Telecom, BlackBerry. We've had our champions in those fields. Ivan, let me bring you back in here. Compared to how the United States does stuff, how do they monetize their discoveries differently from the way we do? One of the big differences, uh, both between Canada and the U.S. and also some other uh, developed countries, Japan and Germany, for example, is uh, there's comparatively less uh, investment in research and development from the business community. Uh, you know, sorry, from from the business sector. Uh, it's it's sometimes called bird. This this amount uh, of funding that would come for research from the business side versus you know, public funding or higher education. So that's a bit of a, of a gap that Canada struggles to fill. It means that public funding from the government has to try to fill that gap. That's one of the reasons why, why it's lower. I think there are other reasons too. You know, we are, uh, there, there, you know, there is a bit of a branch plant uh, effect here in Canada. You know, the big multinationals that are uh, major contributors to research often head offices are in the uh, US or in Europe or in other areas. Uh, less of that kind of primary research is being funded in Canada from those companies. So that's part of the reason. Hmm. I also think, though, that there is a cultural difference. In the US, science is seen as strategic. It's centrally important to the US and its, its role in the world. And I think here in Canada, one thing, I, I've covered a lot of science in the US. I was a bureau chief in Washington for Nature and also in Boston for New Scientist. And the sense of critical mass and speed, it's like Dr. Archer was saying, Canada's wonderful, but when you step into the US research community, you sort of, it's, all, it's like stepping onto one of those walking sidewalks that everything <laughs> seems to be moving faster. Um, and, and you have a sense that uh, people are keeping an eye on it. In addition to, the, the funders, you know, the governments or others that are giving the money for the research and the researchers who are receiving the funding, there's kind of a third leg of the stool, think tanks, policy groups, strategizers, people who are analyzing all of this and trying to say, like, how do we optimize this? I think in Canada, that third part is missing. There's not, not as much um, um, critical mass of people who are watching this whole process. Well, let me get Stephen Archer on that. Is the monetization of scientific discoveries something that you think is encouraged uh, in academia in this country? Uh, not as much as it should be. And I, I just add on top of what Ivan said, NIH gets $39 billion a year. CIHR has $1.4 billion. So we're only one-tenth the size of the United States, so we're severely financially disadvantaged in terms of federal investment. And on the business side, you know, my lab has several patents for different mitochondrial therapeutics, and it's, there is a branch plant mentality. The people you're talking to in Canada don't run these international drug companies. They are branches of it, and so there's not a lot of either philanthropy or business investment in this. And so I think this is where CIHR's role is really critical in funding science, and it is hard to get money for commercialization. There's a lot of barriers to that. And, and the one thing that listeners may not appreciate is just that when you talk about scientists, you might think of some geek like myself who's working on how mitochondria divide and move in cells. But this geek day job is to be a cardiologist. I'm going this afternoon to see cardiology patients in my clinic. I run the Department of Medicine. I build a translational research center. And that's true for most of my colleagues across the country. So 
every nickel that CIHR or CFI put out really comes back to the government of Canada as <clears throat> income tax, sales tax, and the spin-off benefits that people are more aware of, which is good science and patents and new products. So I think it, it's really the best investment you could possibly make. I mean, that's what the NAILA report highlighted was you get great value for this money. The more you spend, the more benefit you get. We should just do a follow-up on that. Uh, Naylor Report is the David Naylor Report. He was the former president of the University of Toronto who did a report, I guess, five or six years ago, something like that. Ivan, what was the mission behind that report? This was a landmark document. Uh, so when the Trudeau government came in in 2015, you know, they came in on kind of restoring science to its rightful place. There's a lot of politics there because of uh, the, the image that the Harper government, the outgoing Harper government had with respect to science, especially environmental science and government scientists. Uh, although, you know, truth be told, the actual funding uh, for research is pretty similar across the two governments. Anyway, the idea was, let's do an overhaul. Let's take a whole a look at the entire research infrastructure. David Naylor was uh, the chair of this committee that did that. They really went in deep. They did uh, very extensive interviews across the country. The panel produced this report with several recommendations. Were they followed up on? Uh, some, uh, and many would say not enough. Of course, part of the recommendation was the whole ecosystem just needs more support. It, it needs more, you know, m more money going in. But there are other recommendations about the way that money could be distributed, and some of that has been debated over. Uh, and some of the recommendations have been taken on board in some ways. Things have evolved. <laughs> but I would say two areas that the report pointed out that are worth thinking about, and these are disproportionately affected when you don't have enough funding, is noting that a lot of the big discoveries tend to come from high risk, high reward kind of research. You know, let's give this a shot. We don't know if it's going to work. Let's try it. Uh, and also from cross-disciplinary research where researchers from different disciplines come together in unusual ways or perhaps working with outside, like, you know, uh, international ex expertise, mm. kind of putting together unusual partnerships and something comes out of it. When funding is tight, you know, people become more risk averse. Take fewer risks, yeah, for and, sure. and so then it becomes like, well, let's just play it safe. Mm. Sarah, I want to uh, tap into your knowledge as uh, one of the very few people in this country, I'm sure, who had the opportunity to testify before a parliamentary committee, which you did. Uh, Kirsty Duncan, the Etobicoke North MP, former science minister, was the chair of that committee. What did you tell her? <laughs> yeah, I shared a lot of the same stats that we talked about today, which is exciting. Um, the response that we got from the standing committee was positive. A lot of the MPs were concerned about the, some of the stats that we were bringing up in the in the committee. But um, I was quite disappointed once we got to see the report for the committee come out for the um, the study that I appeared for. Um, we were asking for about 48% increase in the graduate student scholarships uh, to adjust for inflation over the last 20 years since they've changed the last time. Uh, but the committee came out and suggested a 25% increase in the in the scholarships, um, which I think puts us in, I think, 2015 numbers, which still puts us way far behind. Um, another point of that is we were really talking about the idea of adjusting these awards to inflation. Um, this was something that was done in Australia, for example, where they continue to adjust awards uh, granted to graduate students and postdocs over the course of, of years so that they we don't get to the situation years down the line. Um, but yeah, that, that part seems to be up for debate with some MPs and, and yeah, maybe they're not so in favor of that part of it. Well, ultimately, of course, it's not those MPs who make the decision. It's the finance minister who makes the decision. Do, do you feel you got a fair hearing and that they at least get what you're trying to say? I think they get what we're trying to say. I think obviously the, the fiscal reality of Canada right now is that when the budget comes in the spring, we're not in a, in a situation where we can provide these big investments that science I think require at the moment. So the biggest thing that we're trying to push at the moment is the significance and the urgency of the, of the matter and try to put it into the, the frame of, of what this impact is long term. Um, but yeah, I think at the moment, there's just so many other things going on in, in Canada's economic reality that it's hard for us to make this case. Well, let me hit, hit on this with Stephen Archer, because you know, I can imagine people are watching this right now saying, OK, so a bunch of PhD students aren't getting as much money as they want. Big deal. Who cares? And I, I guess the reason who cares is that when a global pandemic hits and you're a country that needs vaccines and you don't make any vaccines anymore, that's a problem, and you're at the end of the line around the world in terms of getting access to life-saving vaccines. Can you talk to us about how, Dr. Archer, how did we get to a point where we are 
just so scientifically apparently dependent on so many others when a hundred years ago we might have been at the forefront of so much of this? It's an interesting question. I just would also just add to Sarah's comments that, in fact, Let's Talk Science is a group that looks at graduate students, and they've plotted that the numbers of Canadian students going into science is completely flat. The only reason we're not falling precipitously is because of international students coming to Canada. That's where our science is coming from. So why does it matter? I'll tell you, and everyone that knows me uh, that listens to this will laugh. I'm way too liberal to live in the United States, and I'm way too aggressive to live in Canada. So I, I need to sit on the border somewhere, and probably in a padded suit. And I think the answer is complacency. Canadians are complacent. We're one of the few people that are content with a bronze medal, and we're content to have pretty good science. And not for like hockey. Everyone to be nice and polite. Not for hockey, yeah, Stephen Archer. Hockey. We want gold in hockey, but you everything know, else bronze, eh? I, my league is called the Leftovers. I proudly play every Wednesday and Sunday, but except for hockey. We are diverted. And one of the things the Naylor report highlighted was the fact the government is interfering, for want of a better term, in science. So they proposed that an independent scientific committee, not bureaucrats, but scientists, be used to advise science on big investments, uh, CHR and other agencies on big investments. Um, and so I think it, it is important to recognize that we're just not ambitious enough and we're not creating jobs. And that's partly. The, you know, when uh, graduate students like Dr. future Dr. Laframboise are uh, done, people like me are hiring them. I can't hire them if I don't have money. I don't get money if I can't get CIHR grants. And CIHR is simply underfunded by one point some billion dollars. So if we invested that money, she'd have a job. I'd have a bright graduate student who, like many graduate students in my lab, go on to become faculty members. They teach our university students. They invent things. And so complacency is what allows us to just sit put and uh, watch ourselves stagnate behind other countries. And um, I, I think it would be a fairly simple fix to change the funding model at CHR. So, for example, one of the problems, like I'm going to get notice on two grants today, they will probably be rejected, even though in theory I'm a world leader in these fields. I will have to write them two more times before they get funded. We used to have something called foundation grants. Foundation grants took all my ideas, so I have three or four big ideas in my lab, bundled them all together. I was funded at a rate of about $3 million for seven years, so I wasn't constantly churning and applying. They were The foundation grant program was reviewed, and it was positive. The review was never released, and the program was terminated. And I think the belief was we needed not a bunch of old fat cats like me, but a bunch of young people doing science. But it's an ecosystem where you need tall trees and small trees, and there's no point funding young investigators if old investigators are out the back door. So bringing back the foundation grant and increasing the funding envelope while paying graduate students more and having CFI fund people to operate infrastructure platforms would counteract the complacency that has crept into Canadian science, and it would make us competitive with the United States. Understood. we got about a minute and change left here, Ivan, and I wonder whether, how do we get more business money into the system as well? Uh, I Well, I, that's maybe the, the wicked problem because that has to do with how our, uh, you know, how the economy is set up. We still have a very resource intensive economy. Mm -hmm. Maybe that will change as we get to things like, uh, you know, new ways of getting to energy, uh, you know, other, other ways of uh, uh, kind of using our resources. I, I think, though, still there at the bottom of all of this, there's a culture issue. I just want to point out, in addition to the Naylor report, a few years ago, the Council of Canadian Academies put out a report looking at Canadian attitudes to science. The bottom line was Canadians overall are very positive about science, maybe even more than other countries that invest more. But the, I, th I think the telling uh, detail in that was fewer Canadians see themselves, see science as essential to their lives. In, in other words, to their jobs or to their livelihoods. They like watching the nature show on TV. They like going to the science center, but they don't see it as central to their life. And, and they think, need to. And we need to. We should be having this conversation at least once a year, I think. Okay, same time next year. You bet. <laughs> All right. I want to thank the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and helping us out with this. Sarah Lefwamboise, the PhD student in biochemistry at the University of Ottawa. Sarah, I hope you graduate. I hope you get a fantastic job and you invent the cure to something. So well done. Stephen Archer, uh, head of the Department of Medicine at Queen's University. Ivan Semenik, whom you read in the Globe and Mail. They're longtime science journalists there. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. 
Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.